Welcome to Citizens Insight, the Citizens Party's interview series for YouTube, where we draw out subjects of interest from Australian citizens relevant to Australian politics and the uh, economic crisis that we're in and what we can do about it. This week's episode of Citizens Insight is a change in pace from previous episodes because today we're going to discuss the China narrative. And my guest today is researcher Melissa Harrison. Welcome, Melissa. Thanks for having me, Robbie. Before we get into the subject, I want to make a disclaimer. And I'm assuming regular viewers of Citizens Insight will also be regular viewers of the Citizens Report, and they might be familiar with um, uh, me, you know, rather, rather aggressively, I, I admit, in recent times, combating what I call anti-China um, disinformation. Now, we never do justice to the subject on the, on the Citizens Reports because there's a time limit on those shows. So we're going to do more justice to the topic on this um, episode of the Citizens Insight because it's a topic that people need to uh, understand. It's very relevant to Australia because of our relationship with China. But the disclaimer is we're not trying to convince anybody that China is the greatest country on earth. That's not what the Citizens Party's position is. And in fact, there's plenty about China that we would criticise and uh, disapprove of. It's an authoritarian country, and would we want that authoritarian authoritarianism in Australia? Of course we wouldn't. However, there's a but there. Um, some of what we're going to go through later shows how a lot of what you think you know about China is grossly exaggerated. Um, but more importantly, we believe that countries ultimately should learn to mind their own business. Um, the last 20 years in the world has not been a tw a two decades of China's atrocities. There have been two decades of atrocities by Western countries starting wars for regime change, telling their public this is to introduce democracy into those targeted countries, right, like Iraq, like Libya, like Syria, etc., and committing absolute carnage, war crimes, etc. Right? That's the greater evil than whatever China's system may be. And if we learn to mind, mind our own businesses, then from that standpoint of non-interference, you can find with any country common ground. And that's what we're advocating with China. There is great grounds for common ground with China, and um, especially from Australia, because we've the way it's happened, and we didn't advocate for this in terms of the evolution of economic policy, but the way it's happened is China has become Australia's biggest trading partner. And right now, when you have economic crisis conditions, <laughs> you, you, you really see how that's an important connection that we have, right? Because China um, is, is a very successful economy. It has shown in its recent history it's been able to learn from its mistakes and not just learn from them, make improvements that have frankly been spectacular such as raising you know, close to a billion people out of poverty through the biggest investment program in infrastructure and um, industry the world's ever seen. Right? And we think that that's um, something that Australia can cooperate with and not be afraid of. In the last few years, though, that's all turned bad for us. The, 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 the Australia-China relations have suddenly become very hostile. And we've started accusing China of all kinds of things, including a massive infiltration of Australian politics and Australian society. Many of those claims originated with one book, and it's called Silent Invasion by Clive Hamilton. And it's a, it's a racially charged book that alleges that China has been running this clandestine massive infiltration foreign interference campaign in Australia. And that's set up all sorts of knock-on effects, which... Um, most people would be aware this year we, the relationship by, by now is totally poison. So my guest, Melissa Harrison, has read the book and investigated the claims that the author Clive Hamilton has made. And in the process, she's identified a tight-knit apparatus that is um, responsible for turning Australia hostile against China. And that's what this subject is going to be about today. That's what I'll be interviewing Melissa on. So with that... With that um, introduction, Melissa. Let's get started. Why do you call your reports? You've written you've written five a five part series called the China Narrative. Why do you call it the China Narrative? 
Basically because as I started uh, researching into the background behind Professor Clive Hamilton's book, I realized that all of the news reports that we've been seeing lately over the last couple of years, all of the themes in those reports are actually reflected in those books. And I just realized that this is not a grassroots um, kind of spontaneous news about Chinese foreign interference. It's actually a PR campaign, a carefully directed PR campaign. And um, that's kind of what started me on this rabbit hole. <laughs> now you, you wrote about those things, which rang true for me, um, not necessarily related to China because um, I've been in politics long enough to remember the same experience of a narrative um, being drummed out into people, um, when it, whether it was in relation to Iraq and getting the war going in Iraq and subsequent regime change events. And I felt I was seeing the same thing and your research has basically confirmed you are. Um, one of the curiosities, if we want to talk about Clive Hamilton specifically though, that you identified, before he wrote this book or before the year or so before he wrote this book, he wasn't really hung up on China, was he? No, he primarily focused on climate change. Um, that was his kind of background. And I went through his social media and he has a blog as, on his website that he writes a lot on. And before he wrote this book, he there was nothing really untoward about China at all. In fact, he actually um, called China a new and enigmatic superpower. And he actually thought that China's more author authoritarian government would actually be more helpful in fighting climate change because yeah. they could kind of make uh, rules and orders that you know a, a Western country might not be able to. So that was his kind of position before then. And all of a sudden it's just uh, switched. And of course that, that raised the question, how? So um, your research identified that he, had a, a re that he had a research assistant who turned out to be quite significant. Yeah, so he's um, Clive Hamilton, uh, Professor Clive Hamilton is at uh, ANU, or he was, he's at uh, Charles Sturt now. And um, at ANU was also this uh, young man, Alex Josky. Um, he ended up being the research assistant for Silent Invasion. Um, Josky, he's the son of Stephen Josky, who's uh, like a, a high up treasury official who was stationed uh, at the um, Beijing embassy for many years. So Josky, young Josky actually grew up in uh, China and is fluent in Mandarin. Um, so while he was at ANU, he started doing the research for Silent Invasion. Um, I'm not sure if it's the same, it's around about the same time. He was also editing and writing for ANU's student newsletter where um, he was writing about like CCP influence on the university campus and quite a few of the anecdotes from his uh, newsletter articles actually got into silent invasion. Um, yeah. Interesting. Yeah, so on the surface, when people first started hearing about young Alex, who today is still only 22, Right, so this is when he was 19 and 20 that he first came to prominence this way. Um, people, the assumption was this is a bit like, you know, um, a, a, a typical university student, um, you know, being political on campus, etc. But Alex Josky's connections proved to be quite important. So you mentioned, you mentioned his father there. That's not an unimportant connection, but. Um, uh, what we do know, and you identified in, in the book, is uh, where Alex Josky works now, the Australian Strategic Policy Institute, also clearly had a role in Clive Hamilton's book, to the point you've, you've gone so far as to call it ghostwritten. <clears throat> yeah, that's a bit cheeky, but um, that was my impression. Um, Alex Josky actually was went to Aspie kind of straight out of Sorry, I'll call it ASPI. I'm talking about the Australian yeah. Strategic Policy Institute. He went there straight after uni and um, is now on, you know, a strategic analyst on the news all the time. This is straight out of university. Um, and oh, a twenty, a twenty-two-year-old. Well, yeah, I think he's twenty-three now, but he's very young. Yeah. So um, yeah, I actually found that. Um, when I was reading his book, I was like, oh, a lot of these kind of things are like ringing a bell. They're quite familiar. And then um, I realize that I'd read them before in kind of Aspie articles and Aspie reports. So I went to the acknowledgements of Silent Invasion and there's just a laundry list of names of um, Aspie analysts. They're not identified as working for Aspie, but the names are all there. So that's why I kind of like this feels ghostwritten by Aspie. And that's very, I, I reckon it's a good description because that's very curious. There are, they're all Aspie people, but they're not identified as Aspie in the acknowledgements. Why? Well, there's a reason why, 
and that's because of what ASPE is. So the Australian Strategic Policy Institute, it's a, it was originally started by the um, Australian Defence Department. However, it's a, it's a, a curiosity in, among Australian think tanks because it is heavily funded. I mean, it's mostly funded by the Australian government and it's actually um, it's audited by the Australian Audit Office, the, the, Auditor, the Auditor General, that's, that's also a bit unusual, but it it's also receives a lot of funding from foreign governments. And chief among those is the US State Department, for which reason I've started calling it the Mike, pa the Mike Pompeo funded ASPE. NATO, I think the government of the Netherlands is in there. Um, uh, the government of Japan is in there. And that's, a, that's more than ironic because the, 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 the biggest, the whole point of Clive Hamilton's book, right, was paranoia, silent invasion. There's this foreign inter influence campaign in Australia coming from China. Yet the organisation behind the guy who and the book that wrote the claims, I would argue, is the biggest foreign interference operation in Australia. Well, yeah, and then not only foreign governments, they're also funded by um, arms manufacturers as well, yeah. like Lockheed Martin and Raytheon and stuff like that, which is another really interesting twist considering how much China agitating they're doing. And then when you look at the concurrent... Uh, like in the US particularly, the amount of money that these organisations are getting from this agitation of the public in regards to China and Russia, it's like, well, there's a bit of a financial incentive. Um, well, that's, yeah, that's, that's called the uh, military industrial complex, right? It's right that <laughs> there's, there's, money, there's money to be made. Of, that's, not the, that's not the only motivation for war, but there's definitely money to be made from it. And those, those elements are there. Um, the ones on the sponsorship list are all the, all the American ones, but the, there's a, um, an ex-BAE systems guy on the board of ASPE, and that's the biggest British, uh, uh, what do you call it, arms manufacturer, right? Um, and this, you know, these are, this, so, so there's, it, there's a big British establishment hand in ASPE as well. I noticed that there's also a former Governor General's private secretary, or official secretary on the board of ASPE. And I can tell you now that's incredibly significant because the person who gets to become the official secretary of the Governor General in Australia is Uber establishment, right? And so they're on the board of ASPE. Um, and yeah, they have been every, almost if I wanna, for the, for the sake of the viewer, I wanna challenge you to do something. Next time you see an, an, an anti-China article, I, in an hour's time when you're on the internet or tomorrow and you're going to see one every day like you have. That's, this is one of the things we keep pointing out. This is relentless what you're getting about China. Actually read it. Don't just read the headline. Actually read it and invariably 99 out of 100 of them are sourced from claims by ASPE. Everything reported in Australia at the moment from China starts, 99 out of 100 of them start with um, claims made by ASPE. And no one is... No one in official them is saying, why is this one organisation making all the claims and talking about nothing but China, right? And that, that's who um, ASPE is. But just on the State Department connection, um, Melissa, uh, we're talking in Australian terms, but we do have to be mindful. One of the, um, there were inf there's international events that have influenced Australia. And so uh, the, the State Department connection obviously reflects the fact that the change that's happened in Australia in regard to China, the sudden turn against China, follows a similar sudden turn in the United States foreign policy. Yeah, that's correct. So you can actually find, um, like, around, it's always around 2016, 2017 is when it really kicked off and it's just escalated since then. So you can actually find, I think, uh, like 2017, the US national security um, report was like, okay, so China and Russia are now a threat to us. And then in 2018, the Pentagon budget, the guy who presented that actually said, we're no longer going, we're no longer fo focusing on a war on terrorism. It's now a war against greater competition. So essentially announcing a new cold war against China and Russia on the basis of competition, which is just yep. terrible. No, that's, that's right. But that's, that's what's called the Wolfowitz Doctrine. It was enunciated in 1992 that, America, that from that moment on, post-Cold post War then, the real Cold War, American foreign policy would preclude the rise of any rival power, economic or military, and, and doesn't, whether they were communists or not was irrelevant, right? We're just not going to tolerate the rise of a rival power. There's going to be a, uni, a unipolar world, Anglo-American world. And that's what, that was restated in those reports. Um, it's very important, though, that people understand what you just said. The fact that the first um, assessment 
that, that, call, that suddenly called China and Russia threats was in 2016 means it happened pre-Trump. And this is, this is very important because we know everyone's familiar with Trump's rhetoric about China, which has worsened as, as his uh, presidency has gone on. Um, but there's always been this element where, despite the rhetoric, as with North Korea, you know, Trump is capable of, of cutting a deal, right? However, the people around Trump and the, the what, in, in Washington they call it the blob. The foreign, the foreign policy established in Washington is known as the blob. They set this direction as of 2016 onwards, right, in, 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 in formal terms, and it was building up to that. Um, so this is not a Trump phenomenon. This is a, an establishment phenomenon that we're dealing with. And, if, and essentially Australia is aligning itself with it, of course, at great expense because um, the, the, you know, China, we, we've become hostile to our, our biggest trading partner. So let's get more specific, um, Melissa, because in looking at the book, um, and people can read the, the details. I, I mean, I, I really encourage everyone, all the, the five-part series is on our website and it's worth reading. Whether you... Um, whether you're anti-China, pro-China, or neutral, read it because it's a it, it's 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 Melissa has done something that most people can't do or won't do, which is dig into the claims that get made rather than just accept them on face value. Um, uh, so, the silent invasion got the ball rolling um, in the public's mind, but an operation was definitely already building. And so there's there's another character that is associated with Josky with ANU with Hamilton and with Aspie, who we've identified as probably as much as anybody um, the most central to this picture, and that's John Garno. Tell us about him. Yeah, <clears throat> so um, John Garno is a former Fairfax correspondent. He was stationed in Beijing for years, many years. And then uh, when he came back to Australia, very soon after, he actually was um, experienced this meteoric career rise to becoming a, a a senior advisor to Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull. Um, and he's widely credited with being very influential in Turnbull's sudden shift of hostility towards China. Um, so, and then also not long after that, he actually collaborated with our domestic spy agency ASIO to write the Garno ASIO report, which is still classified. Um, and it basically, provided the basis or the justification for the Turnbull government's espionage and foreign interference laws, which are really, really controversial laws. Um, so um, he's gone on since then to be even more influential in this kind of um, China narrative campaign. Um, in uh, March this year, he was actually um, part of the espionage and foreign interference laws with this foreign interference, foreign influence transparency scheme, which is supposed to catch out corporations who are being influenced by foreign countries aimed at China. Um, and for the first year it existed, uh, it never used its powers once to issue any of these transparency notices. Um, and apparently that wasn't the result they were looking for because in March this year, Attorney General Christian Porter turfed out the whole leadership team and replaced them with this like crack team of espionage experts gonna hunt out spies on our soil and stuff. Um, and Garneau was actually hired uh, to prepare evidentiary briefs against organizations that were um, uh, foreign influenced. And now just recently, suddenly the FITS is using its powers and it's actually using them against universities um, claiming that they're influenced by um, foreign interference. Um, so when Garno, yeah. when, when Garno uh, joined Turnbull's office, Turnbull took his hostile turn against China and that would have involved the, the whole Huawei issue, etc. And then when Garno was appointed to this foreign inter influence <laughs> transparency scheme, for 12 months before that, it had found nothing. Suddenly, Garno's there, and all these all these scandals erupt that have become the basis for um, the government demanding more powers, such as against universities, etc. So that that would indicate Garno is a significant person in this picture. Yeah, but interestingly, um, as a fair when he was a Fairfax journalist, he was involved in accusing this prominent Chinese Australian businessman, um, Dr. Chor Chak Wing. He um, wrote this like expose. Uh, saying that he was uh, guilty of um, being involved in this bribery conspiracy of bribing this UN official. And um, D uh, Dr. Tor actually took them to court and uh, they won that defamation suit. 
Um, and the judge's comments on Garneau's character are just like really scathing. Um, and yet this guy is um, highly influential still. And he actually in May this year got a contract from our Department of Defense's um, information warfare unit. So for, for strategic planning. So, you know, it's like... It, well, yes. well, let me put it in these terms. If the media covered John Garneau the way they cover China, where anything China does is the Nazi stormtroopers conquering the world, whatever it does, yeah. they should at least, they could look at what this judge said about John Garneau, who totally shredded his credibility, right? He said in this court case, he shredded his credibility, no honesty, no credibility whatsoever. And you listen to what this judge is saying, you go, that guy, that guy is the, is the bloke whose who's influence has shaped our entire foreign policy and put us in this position. If I were a barley farmer in Australia or a wine grower, right, or a, or a beef exporter, I'd say, hang on, the Australian government has made these decisions that it said that it's important for our pol foreign policy. It's destroying my business on the basis of a guy who has zero real credibility at all, right? Yet it doesn't, you had to dig this up because it's, it's not reported in tabloid style headlines the way that uh, anything anti China is. And it's actually shocking. I'm still shocked thinking about it now that this guy just got away with slandering a guy, a ju an Australian judge shreds his credibility um, and you think this guy's in charge of making the decisions about China. It's shocking. Um, well, and he's still, on, he's still an authority on the media as well. These exposés that always come out, he's always um, quoted as an authority. Yeah, still. Yeah. Well, now... Let's deal with something at this point which is quite sensitive, but it's, but it's very important because John Garneau is, um, is, is a very close to a couple of Chinese Australians who have both been at different times detained in China. One of them still is. And when it happens, um, the headline is um, one that assumes that they're totally innocent, right? But their connection to John Garno probably indicates the opposite. And you dealt, you dealt with it, this in, uh, I think, part three on the, the espionage section of your report. Just elaborate on that a bit, please. Yeah, I did. So um, because um, these two people, they have long standing, long like friendships, close friendships with John Garno, who has intelligence connections. He, he collaborated with ASIO to write that report for the espionage and interference um, laws. So I started looking into both of them. Um, the first one will probably be quite familiar. That's Dr. Yang Hen Jun. He was detained in China in January 2019. Um, there was like a massive media uproar and Andrew Hasty, despite saying nothing for Julian Assange, said that um, Yang was, uh, you know, a detention of him as a detention of us all. And, you know, he's a citizen here and like all this defense of him. Um, but then um, as time kind of went on, all of these like uh, kind of murky details about Yang's past started to come up. Um, and the ABC actually, uh, despite their normal um, zealous hunting down of alleged spies, they published this huge um, expose like explaining why Yang was a friend to democracy and oh, no, 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 he's not a spy. And then it's as it turns out, um, our Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade can't confirm whether he's actually a citizen or not. And it turns out that Yang actually had a really long history of working in Chinese espionage in their intelligence. And this was in the 80s, I think. Um, and he was in the US apparently spying on US government officials and stuff. So he's involved, and, he was definitely involved in Chinese espionage. And then he comes yes. to, to come to Australia and, he, and where he hangs out with Australian, Australian spies, basically, Australian spy agencies. Yeah, and um, there's quite a few um, like interesting details. I mean, what's really interesting is that he is now a um, supposed to be making a living being a democracy activist and a democracy blogger. Um, and then as I started to look into that background, um, he's signed and is part of this um, democracy movement in China that's been going for a really long time. There's a central figure um, that's passed away now, but his name's Lu Bao. He was actually ordered, um, given a Nobel Peace Prize for his democracy work. Yet when you look into his background, he's actually been um, funded for a very, very long time by um, this massive organization um, called the uh, National Endowment for Democracy, yeah. which is a US government funded organization that is supposed to be promoting democracy overseas. 
But what they actually do is um, funnel money into like activist organisations to implement regime change and agitate foreign governments. They, they fund in, um, in their own description or someone, some, some American government official's description of them, they fund the foreign insurrections that the CIA used to fund and got a bad yeah. reputation for. Now this National Endowment for Democracy funds them. Yeah, so the guy who wrote the legislation for the NED said what we do now is what the CIA used to do covertly 25 years ago. Yeah. Um, so they basically have been pouring heaps of money into these kind of Chinese activist organisations and people, um, and then they agitate and they used as a source in, in Australian and international media as, you know, accusations of human rights abuses or things like that that the Chinese government has, has supposedly done. Then you look and they're actually... US State Department, this NED funded yeah. organization. And Melissa, from, from the outside, someone who, a Chinese person who's prepared to stand up to the totalitarian Chinese government, um, probably seems admirable. But Lu Bao, when he expressed his opinion on sub subjects like the Iraq war, for instance, which yeah. I consider a fairly black and white issue, he showed a, an interesting side of his you know, identity that would make you wonder, may, well, maybe the Chinese government should be right to frown on this guy. What did he say about the Iraq war? He was very supportive of the Iraq war and was like all the casualties were worth it for democracy. And he also um, was a big uh, fan of colonialism. Like he said this horrible quote that to choose westernization is to choose to be human. And he was just like a huge fan of like this, like a hardcore neoconservative. Yeah, yeah. And he NED gave him their democracy award and he's like always brought out as this like you know, you know, he won a Nobel Peace Prize and this is his background. Um, so he actually wrote a democracy manifesto called Charter 08. And there's a like a big circle around him of all these activists and lawyers and intellectuals who um, were part of this Charter 08. Um, yet it had all of this backing of like US NED, like CIA linked money kind of thing. Um, so back to Yang Hanjun, that was a bit of a, um, back to Yang Hanjun. He's an, another one of these people who've signed this Charter 08 and is involved in these kind of um, organisations that are affronting as, you know, democracy promoters, but they're not necessarily dissidents. They're, they're really more separatists and they're kind of agitators. Um, and what people, yeah, have and to what people have to understand, <laughs> just, just to elaborate on that, what people have to understand is for a country like China, but almost all countries in the world, if you're going to be a separatist, if you're going to agitate to bring down your government, etc., you're making yourself an enemy of that government, right? It's not the same as, oh, I'm, I'm, a, I'm an innocent dis dissident just trying to voice my opinions. No, you're declaring war. And, and therefore, people have to understand that what, what looks like maybe a heavy-handed reaction from China is on separatists, and um, these happen to be the people that are friends of John Gano. Well, I mean, not only that, um, when Yang was in the US for two years before he was detained in January 2019, um, and the night that he left and the same guy took him to the airport, his, he was with his longtime friend of 18 years called Waikin Meng. Um, and this man is actually central to this 2011, what looks like an attempted color revolution in China. Yeah. Um, this man's organization funded by the NED based in the US, they're like a publication and they were basically the central agitator for this. They called them pro-democracy protests, but I actually went trawling through WikiLeaks and found um, that this private intelligence organization called Stratfor was actually really onto this. And they were like, this is, this is, uh, this is not, this is not grassroots. It's not, um, you know, a spontaneous. It's externally directed, I think they noted. Yeah, it was directed and they thought it was the, U the US and then later um, the Stratfor analysts were like, the Chinese government thought that this was the CIA directing Tiananmen 2. Um, and this guy Meng that Yang was um, with and was friends with for 18 years and went it was hanging out with just before he went to China where he was detained was a central figure in this kind of attempted color revolution that actually um, didn't happen because the Chinese government was censoring the internet and stuff like that. So when he went to China last year, this is back to John Garneau's friend now, and got detained in China, and he's still detained in China, he almost definitely is involved in espionage in some form, and therefore China detaining him would be what any country would do if they found a similar person in their country. Oh, yeah, and he's been formally charged now um, with espionage. And our media and everything has been like, how could they? Like, this is, you know, not thinking, well, maybe he actually... Um, 
as it's, it's possible. Doing That's it. right. <laughs> yeah. No, it's possible. Yeah. Tell us about the other um, the other person because he actually has been outed as an ASIO informer. Yeah. So um, the, uh, Yang Hanjun's doctoral supervisor uh, is Professor Feng Chong Yi. Um, he's been in Australia for a very long time. He's like a um, a common authority brought up in our media as um, basically um, anti CCP, whatever it is. Um, and he, um, again, with Yang Hinjun is another person who's um, been part of this like democracy movement of the Charter 08, big supporter of Liu Zhibao, and again, involved with these organizations that when you trace them back, they're all getting NED money, these activist organizations. Um, so he, in 2017, he was actually um, detained while in China um, on, on basically investigation of, uh, you know, potential foreign intelligence connections, um, which, and they basically said that, you know, he's accused of being a spy. When he came back to Australia, he denied this on Sky Media. Um, yet I found a tweet from Clive Hamilton himself um, yes. saying that, he says, oh, most of the information on CCP comes from Chinese Australians, like Dr. Feng Chong Yi. And he said, where does the Prime Minister think ASIO gets its information from? And I was just <laughs> like, well, that's casual. <laughs> well, that, so, so there, in a tweet, Clive Hamilton outed this, this uh, professor yeah. as an ASIO informer and yeah. completely undoing the claim, the, the media is sort of biased reporting, oh, no, he was perfectly innocent. You know, China had no grounds for questioning him. Now, bear in mind, a lot of what we're having this discussion now where there's, there's been this um, rather intense back and tit for tat happening in China uh, where a couple of Australian journalists were questioned, you know, before they got back to Australia a few weeks ago. But we didn't find out until that happened that ASIO had raided Chinese journalists in Sydney back in June. Um, and, and ASIO's justification was it's looking out for espionage and uh, foreign interference and all that kind of thing. And... Um, uh, you know, so that, that justified its raid. Well, maybe, just maybe, the Chinese are acutely sensitive to that as well. And that raises a more general question associated from, let's, let's go from Gano now to an, an associate of Gano, who's, um, because the, the media is playing a role in this, um, uh, Melissa, and the person we've identified as the most prompt, there's a few of them, but the person who's identified as most prominent in the really aggressive disinformation because of his sensational reporting is uh, Nick McKenzie. Yep, so uh, Nick McKenzie is a nine Fairfax journalist as well. Um, he's been a very leading figure in producing lots of anti-China, anti-CCP exposés and... Um, and he keeps losing lawsuits, doesn't he? He does keep losing lawsuits. <laughs> that should, if a journalist... <laughs> He's lost about three or four. If a journalist who does the most sensationalist reporting on 60 Minutes and that keeps losing lawsuits, you should learn, stop believing that journalist. Well, yeah. And I mean, the thing that he does is exposés that are like shocking, but the, the, the people who star in it are the same people in all my articles. There's about six of them and they're, they're the evidence that he keeps bringing up, you yeah. know. Um, yeah. What's really interesting about Nick McKenzie is as I started kind of like dissecting the timelines of when his exposés come out, there's really interesting um, parallels with what's kind of going on in like the rest of our, you know, politics. Yeah. And it, it's really interesting because his exposés are kind of timed uh, to back up things that are like ASIO chief says. So our spy chief will say, well, we can't name the country, but there's foreign interference happening on an unprecedented scale. And everyone's like, who is it? And then two days later, this massive expose of um, Nick McKenzie's comes out and says the CCP is interfering in Australia. So it's like backing each other up. Um, and then also I, I, I found- just, I just want to mention a few examples though, because uh, of, of, of Nick McKenzie reporting, um, uh, and you can comment on those uh, and, and finish your thought. But Nick McKenzie uh, repeated, he got sued over the same thing that um, John Garno got sued over, but by quoting Andrew Hasty, and we'll talk about Hasty a bit more in a minute, uh, Nick McKenzie did this sensational story last uh, December, I believe, on, the, on the, um, the, the spy, the Chinese spy who defected in Australia which turned, for all intents and purposes, I think we can conclude as a total hoax. 
Um, it was really dramatic, hit 60 Minutes headline at the time. That was a Nick McKenzie story. And this is a significant bit, the, probably the most telling thing about Nick McKenzie. Nick McKenzie was the journalist on the spot with 60 Minutes back in June when the New South Wales Labor MP, Shalcat Mosselmain, was raided by ASIO and the Australian Federal Police, which was a sensational story. What we didn't realise, it was the same day that ASIO was raiding these Chinese journalists. And they had Nick McKenzie there, and I believe he had to come from Melbourne, right? They had to really tip him off to get in there. They, 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 they handpicked this guy to be the sensation, to, to do the sensationalist report on it. Six weeks later, Shower Cat Mosselmain, who's reputation was trash made the point that it, by then ASIO still hadn't interviewed him so this whole thing was staged for cameras and Nick McKenzie was the guy with the camera staging it for them yep yeah I mean this poor guy he still hadn't been so six weeks later I was like I haven't been questioned I haven't like they've never even told me I'm even under suspicion um why did that why was it allowed to be filmed live um and it's really like the implications are quite scandalous because the Attorney General's office has to uh, approve the ASIO warrant. ASIO is directing this so-called investigation. The AFP are involved, the media is involved. It's like, they're all. this is shocking. They're all working together to pr produce a sensationalist reporting that's ruined someone's reputation. And they haven't even said they're even implicated in a crime. I mean, what country are we living in? This is terrible. Well, Shellcat Mosselmain is definitely collateral damage in this. What is an is is in what is actually a foreign policy agenda? It's clear in the media. I mean, this is this is why you call it the narrative, right? This is these are the things that have that get imprinted in the public's minds. Oh, these these oh, we're getting you know invaded by China and, or whatever. And it's all when you scratch the surface, um, there's nothing there. It's all superficial, sensational reporting. I just want to make a comment. Well, I was going to say Mackenzie's um, reporting. I think he's learned from the defamation stuff because his recent stuff is all is always has this disclaimer. Well, yeah. We're not making any suggestion that they're accused of any crime whatsoever. Then why do you write the story? And they just they fall apart as soon as you start looking at them. But yep. by then it's too late. They've had their hysterical media run and the public opinion's been shaped. Now, Melissa, there's some senior journalists in Australia, right? Older generation journalists and older generation public servants and politicians who have raised real concerns about ASIO's role in this picture, but also the journalists that I'm referring to have raised concerns about ASIO's role with the media. And they've talked about how a lot of reporting has be seemed to become media, the media becoming stenographers for ASIO. ASIO is their source and they just repeat verbatim what they're told and that's regarded as a truth. Instead of regarding ASIO, um, you know, circumspectly and saying, why should I trust what they have to say? So an older generation has reflected on this because they know from their experience you shouldn't just take what ASIO says as gospel. And although I don't like quoting Paul Keating on many things, I did appreciate when he said last year that about he even named John Garno and ASIO about as behind this shift in foreign policy towards China. And he said, when ASIO is... Um, running the show, the nutters are in charge. That's, that's what he said, right? But that's an older generation's perspective on this. Um, the way Nick McKenzie behaves and, and, and his clear relationship with ASIO, right, and John Garno um, as well, and Andrew Hasty, you really, that he, he would fit the bill of what these older gener um, journalists are criticising. Well, yeah, I mean, all, I mean, it's all of his reporting is full of confidential sources and anonymous ASIO tip-offs and also um, demonstrate uh, an apparent um, intimate knowledge of things that happened with ASIO years ago. I mean, where's he getting that from? Yeah. Um, yeah. So let's talk about, so let's talk about ASIO then because ASIO is not just an Australian agency. In fact, it, uh, let me put it a different way. ASIO is not an Australian agency at all. ASIO is an organisation that was imposed upon Australia by MI5 originally. We've done a, there's, there's a whole history to this. Ben Chifley, they demanded, MI5 demanded the Australian government, the Chifley government set up ASIO after the war or they wouldn't share, the British wouldn't share intelligence with us. At the same time, the British were demanding the Americans set up the CIA. And what, they, what the British set up is now what's called the Five Eyes. So when, what ASIO does is not an independent Australian agency looking after our security. It's, a, it's part of a global security apparatus, which in practice, not, not constitutionally, but in practice, uh, is allowed to be 
above the authority of governments because what they use is, is, the, is the need for confidentiality and no politician, no democratically elected politician can be trusted with ASIO's information because it involves other governments, right? And this, this sets up a structure. We've become used to it. We accept it. But based on the last two decades, at least, uh, just, just the, the, the intelligence stuff-ups and deliberate lies of the last two decades, which has led to war, we should be questioning it. Um, and we should definitely be questioning it now in relation to this because the final, ver the, the final um, uh, article you wrote in your series is called All Roads Lead to ASIO. Yeah, it does, because <laughs> that's kind of what I found. Um, yeah, I mean, even the espionage legislation, right, um, that was supposed to be in response to all of this media reporting, like, oh, my God, China's interfering. But then I found a, um, a media release from Attorney General Christian Porter's office, like a year later, where they said this legislation was requested by our national security agencies. And then it's really interesting, because in there was like a... Um, an inquiry into them because they were so controversial they like put journalists on the line for 10 years for reporting on um you know asio's uh, confidential misconduct but um our intelligence watchdog the inspector general of intelligence and security raised concerns that this espionage legislation would actually stop them from or inhibit them from being able to do their job because it the legislation reversed the burden of proof. So if a whistleblower came forward and couldn't prove that they had been collecting confidential information to give to the IGIS to report ASIO's misconduct, they face 20 years jail. I mean, who's going to come forward and report on our spy agencies? Um, and, and by the way, by the way, Bill Brown at the Australia Institute um, earlier this month made the point that ASIO, among the five eyes, ASIO has far less parliamentary oversight. We'll, we'll deal with what they do have in a minute, but they have, actually have par, far less parliamentary oversight than their five eyes counterparts, and their actual oversight comes from the Inspector General of Intelligence and Security, yet, as you just said, this law in hinder, hinders it from being able to operate, which means ASIO and the five eyes get to run right across Australia and know who, who's checking on what they do. And when you, when you know their history, they've got no credibility. Sorry, this, this is the apparatus that invented the lies of weapons of mass destruction. They've destroyed the 21st... They, they, it was the war crime of the 21st century. And they're running the show in Australia. And what you documented in your article is this thing called scope creep. It goes beyond just intelligence, right? Yeah, so they've um, managed to... It's, that's why I call it the narrative because they've this PR campaign has enabled them to be like China threat to, with everything. So foreign investment, universities, everything. So and you look at it, Foreign Investment Review Board is a really good example, right? So a couple of years ago, the ASIO chief retired from ASIO. The final report of his um, last ASIO report didn't say anything about foreign investment at all. Then the year he left, he goes and works on the Foreign Investment Review Board, which makes sure that there's nothing untoward with people investing in Australia. Um, and then he, two years later, he got appointed the head of that, in spite of having no experience in economy and business, which usually the head of the Foreign Investment Review Board does have. And ever since he got there, every year, ASIO's assessments of foreign investment has just gone up and up and up and up. And they're advising on um, who can actually um, invest in Australia. And they put their guy there. So it's like not only. Sorry. Sorry. Before you go on, and that's <laughs> coincided with what I regard as the most glaring part of the, this disinformation, this total lie that most Australians believe that China is buying everything up, yet China's ownership of Australia is tiny and falling, whereas the United States and the United Kingdom and Belgium of all countries ownership of Australia is many times greater and rising fast. Yet Australians believe that it's China that's buying us up. Which is weird because I found a, uh, a speech from Josh Frydenberg not long ago where he actually listed the countries in order of percentage. And it, it is the US, the UK, and then China. Um, a long but way yeah, ahead. I mean, you guys pointed out not long ago that um, under cover of um, coronavirus, now these um, intelligence agencies are now getting a say in economic policy and supply chains. Like they're just, they just yeah. want more. And this media campaign is just justifying more. And, and we have, um, the other thing we have is that like the treasuries of the, the Five Eyes countries are coordinating everything together. 
not just intelligence now. It's the Treasuries will have a Five Eyes meeting. I saw the health departments have a Five Eyes meeting, right? It's deep penetration of this already powerful, untouchable external apparatus that is able to control this. And everyone's accepting it because they set up their authority in the, under the, the smoke screen of the China threat, right? And, and yeah. it's one of the, we're actually losing our sovereignty to this. And that's why we're so, we're so um, intent on pushing back against the China threat claims. But before we uh, conclude, Melissa, we have to talk about the parliamentary side of the operation. <laughs> so ASIO does have an oversight body. It's called the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security. And its chair, Ch Chairman Andrew, we'll call him, um, <laughs> is a key player in this apparatus. He is. Um so MP Andrew Hastie is a WA MP, lucky us. Um, he's actually got a, a military background. He worked in the SAS, but actually he was a part of an elite squadron of the SAS, which is like a military intelligence fusion. Um, so he's got that background as well. He's actually a, the most notorious China hawk in parliament. I mean, you've pointed out before that he's worked with the um, Henry Jackson Society. Yeah, um, and he apparently was, um, his China turn is apparently attributed to this speech that John Garneau sent while he was in parliament round to everybody that apparently just blew his mind and turned him against China, even though I read um, reviews of that speech from, you know, former diplomats and stuff. And they're like, it doesn't, that doesn't make any sense. It's historically inaccurate. Um, anyway, um, so he's actually become, quite the source of um, alleged spies um, that turn out to be nothing. Like he'll go to the US on, um, as part of his role as chair and then get uh, contacts with US intelligence and come back and then make these big claims about spies that actually turn out to be nothing at all. Um, a really interesting thing that he did was um, use the, perfection, uh, the protections of parliamentary privilege so they can't be sued for defamation yeah. to repeat Garno's story about um, Dr. Chorchak Wing and that UN bribery um, scandal um, and he said that he'd had intelligence from the US that he was he was involved in this um, and that was a really diplomatically damaging speech it sent huge shockwaves and it was timed as many of these like scandals are timed I found out and I've documented to derail important diplomatic events um, and that's what his speech actually did. Because there um, are people there are people in Australian politics and in Australian Parliament that are very concerned about where this is going and try and do the normal diplomacy that would repair the, rep the, the relationship and every time something like an initiative like that happens bang some scandal derails it and you've identified yeah. there's a deliberate element yeah, to it. Yeah, and so as someone who's uh, got some kind of ASIO connection and then they'll, it will just derail any attempts to uh, like repair these bilateral ties. So that's what his speech did. But what's really interesting is that it turns out that he didn't tell his own prime minister or check with him before giving this speech that was really damaging. But what he did do is tell the ASIO chief, Duncan Lewis, um, that he was going to make this speech. Um, John Menadou is a former um, diplomat and like public service chief and he said that this is uh, like scandalous because the, the guy chairing the committee that is supposed to provide what little oversight ASIO does have is apparently reporting to the ASIO chief and has become a mouthpiece rather than its supervisor. And back to what you said at the beginning of talking about Hasty. His claim that he took this anti-China turn from reading John Garno strikes me as a cover story because he himself has a background in intelligence, which is how, through the SAS, which is how he knows um, Duncan. Yeah, they, they were both in the SAS. I'm not sure if they knew each other, but they were both part of the SAS as well. So this yeah. is John Menager's point. Here's, a, here's an XAS, XAS, SAS guy um, running ASIO and another ex-SAS guy in charge of the parliamentary committee that is the oversight of ASIO, and he's keeping him more closely informed, that the parliamentary chairman is keeping the ASIO chief more closely informed than his own prime minister. And that's not how democracy is supposed to work. While you can accept there may, not there may be, there is a rule for clandestine intelligence to happen, I would argue as an extension of police forces and military, there doesn't need to be a standalone spy agency, but nevertheless, whatever there is, must, if, if we're going to be in a democracy, it must come under democratic authority, right? Yet the only oversight in the Australian Parliament is this one, which is completely corrupted. And the other point about this particular committee um, 
that Andrew Hastie chairs, Melissa, it's a closed shop. It's absolutely a closed shop between the Liberal Party and the Labor Party. There are, there are true intelligence experts in our parliament, namely Andrew Wilkie, the independent member from Tasmania, right, who should be on that committee but, and who's a big champion of, of Julian Assange, but someone like him with real expertise in intelligence is kept off in, 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 in the people running it are Andrew Hasty and his deputy is the Labor guy, and they're both part of this, all, this group, this gang that call themselves the Wolverines that Hasty leads, that leave um, juvenile stickers around Parliament with claws on it, and they, they, they're formed as a gang to protect Australian sovereignty, that's what they say, named after the stupid Cold War movie called um, uh, what was it, Red Dawn. <laughs> and they're fighting, they're fighting the commies for us when, in fact, they are the people in Parliament that are selling us out to this foreign Five Eyes Aspie apparatus. Well, that's the true irony, right? They're like, Australia's sovereignty. But, I mean, Hamilton, I write in one of my articles that Clive Hamilton echoes this kind of ongoing thing where Australia has to surrender its sovereignty to the US and UK foreign policy to keep our, to keep our sovereignty. It's terribly ironic, but no. apparently we, can, we, we can't maintain an independent foreign policy when it comes to China, according to these people. No, that's, that's the point. That's a good point to, to, to um, uh, end on, actually. People have to understand we are not being allowed to be independent towards China because if Australia assessed its relation to China in an independent way, we would, I would argue we would do what I said at the beginning of, the, of the, uh, this episode, right? We would find grounds for common uh, co cooperation and improve our economic um, relationship. Instead, we're going down this path that's set by the Anglo-American powers and it's becoming very con confrontational. There's a definite danger of war. Um, Aspie keeps forecasting a war within months, actually, and, and they're the ones that seem to be doing everything to make it happen. And Australians need to take stock of that. So this is where the China narrative has come from. This is who's written the China narrative that's in your head, I would argue, right? And I think Melissa's done a great service for the country by um, doing this level of investigation, which, frankly, all, chi all claims about China um, deserve. So... Thanks, Melissa. Any final words before we end? Um, I would just ask, again, kind of what, reflecting what you said, just ask people to keep in mind that um, when they're hearing all this stuff about China, just look at who's actually saying it. Yeah. Don't take it on face value. Um, and also recognise that um, this, is, this is a PR campaign. It's a narrative arc. It's not news. Um, and it, there's an end goal in mind that we're being kind of shuffled towards. So I would just say, um, yeah, maybe... Yeah. Do, you do your own research and have a look and see what's actually who's actually saying these things. So yeah. we'll, we'll put the links to Melissa's five articles below. Really encourage people to um, uh, read it. Make make the comments below, <laughs> um, and we'll try we'll try and respond to them. But hopefully, in this longer episode, we've done more justice to the subject than we can ever do on the Citizens Report. And you can see that there's real grounds here to be concerned about how these claims are being formed. Uh, formulated and, and pumped out to the public there. And it has to be, it has to be um, opposed. All right, well, thanks very much, Melissa. Thanks for joining us for this special episode of Citizens Insight. It's been really enjoyable and informative. And tune in for the next episode when that's put up. Thanks very much to the viewer.